We have a really special guest speaker today. He is currently the Director of Development and Church Relations for Hope Worldwide, the benevolent organization that we as a, a fellowship of churches started and support and participate in actively all over the world. But he uh, really began a lot of his, his work as an evangelist, helping plant churches in Latin America, helping oversee the growth of churches in Latin America. Uh, he had been a part of the Los Angeles church uh, for many, many years, overseeing the Lighthouse Church. So uh, recently passed on leadership to that a couple years ago to Mike Mead. But he's just a great friend. Uh, been a partner in the ministry for many, many years. Uh, so you're going to get to hear just from a, a deeply spiritual man who loves serving, he loves seeing lives change, uh, a great teacher of the word, uh, really, really awesome man of God, a, a great friend to Carrie and I, and I know many of you here. So before we get to hear from him, we're going to watch a video, and then you get to hear from Pedro, or as I like to call him, Peter, in my English, unfortunate, I don't have that Latin blood like my wife, but Pedro Garcia will be up here to preach the word of God after this video. Amen. Hope Worldwide brings compassion and tangible resources to those in need. In El Salvador, we've been bringing medical and dental care to local communities through the Hope Worldwide Community Service Brigades for the last 10 years. My name is Lisa Wilder-Baker and I'm a Development Officer at Hope Worldwide. Hope Worldwide Community Service Brigades are groups of volunteers who come together to help serve local communities in Central America and the Caribbean. In May 2024, dedicated doctors, nurses, and Hope Worldwide volunteers gathered in El Salvador once again. Their mission? To provide essential medical and dental care free of charge to those in need. Together, they form the team for the 2024 Community Service Brigade in El Salvador. These volunteers include teachers, doctors, nurses, psychologists, pharmacists, and families who have a desire to serve in areas where people do not have clear access to health services. This year, we celebrated the 10th anniversary of the El Salvador Community Service Brigade, together with over 70 local volunteers. The volunteers joined Hope Worldwide staff in El Salvador, along with Hope Worldwide country directors from Honduras and Guatemala. It was truly an international effort. Alongside the volunteers were members of the Hope Worldwide leadership team, including myself, Dave Tomlinson, COO, our CFO, Jennifer Reyes, and our CEO, Dr. Ben Barnett. Also joining the brigade was Leonard Castellon, the CEO of OB Hospitalist Group. OB Hospitalist Group is the largest OBGYN network in America. Many of their doctors have joined Hope Worldwide Community Service Brigades around the world, and they are now an official partner with us. These skilled medical professionals and passionate volunteers came together to support the rural community of Sochitoto. Many people in Sochitoto do not have easy access to medical or dental care. For many of them, this medical brigade could be their only experience with a dentist or eye doctor for the entire year. My name is Scott, Scott Ellis. I'm an OBGYN physician. I have a military background, but this is a new experience for me. First thing that comes to mind is just the amount of need that there is here. It's filled my heart with joy today to be here and help those in need. Jesus said, if you've done it for the least of these, you've done it, done it for me. I hope that in some small way, as a physician, taking care of the patients in need here, we're being the hands and the heart of Jesus. For me, bringing these parasite pills to the community is so, so important. Something that I may take for granted is so, so important to the people of this community. So, And seeing the kids and their happy faces. Uh, it means just be here caring for people. We just love the people are so welcoming, so excited that we're here. It makes, just makes us feel uh, amazing. They're just very, very grateful. Our focus on providing essential dental care and addressing urgent medical needs was a great help to the entire community in Sochitoto. Together, we experienced firsthand the transformative power of compassion and teamwork. Our brigade is more than medical services. It's a bridge between compassion and action. 14 years ago in Honduras, we embarked on this journey. We believed that healing should know no boundaries, geographical, or financial. And today, as I look around, 
I see the impact in every individual helped, in every smile. We've stitched wounds, filled cavities, and restored hope. But beyond that, we've built connections between neighbors and between nations. After 10 years of this work in El Salvador, the impact of these brigades is being felt for generations. We hope that you'll join us soon as a volunteer so we can continue writing stories of healing, one patient and one smile at a time. Thank you for being a part of something extraordinary. Thank you for being a part of hope. Together, we inspire greater hope. Learn more and apply at hopewworg CSB. Good morning. Just what an honor it is to be with you this morning, and I, I have so much respect. I do have some history with some of you in the West Side Church, and I uh, just want to say how much I appreciate you guys. And none of this, this work that is going on in 61 countries around the world would be possible if it weren't for generous churches like yourselves on the West Side Church. So I want to say thank you. Thank you for being so generous, for sharing what you have so that we could run these programs. And if you ever want to go on one of our trips, whether it's a volunteer corps or a CSBA, Community Service Brigade, we would love to have you. What's amazing is these people come back changed when they go on trips. I don't know if you've ever been on a mission trip, but I highly recommend it. Uh, I get to go on at least once a year uh, on these trips, and it really changes my perspectives, helped me to stay grateful uh, for what I have. So. Buenos días a todos. Es un privilegio de estar con ustedes. Y vamos a con la clase. Y what is hope worldwide about? We believe in inspiring greater hope in our world, in imitating the, minister, the full ministry of Jesus and creating opportunities to build community. And that's who we are. We are a faith-based organization. And, and we're not going to shy away from that. It's, it's what Jesus called us to do, called you to do, to care for people who are hurting. And it, it really does bring out the best in us as well, as followers of Jesus. And so what happens on these trips and what happens in our programs, whether it's in Atlanta, Georgia, right here in your backyard, what happens? We get the unique opportunity to help people and tell them and show them you matter. You may be in a really, really difficult situation, whether it's poverty, you know, uh, you know, wars or, or, or whatever the, the, the situation like the Ukraine, Hope Worldwide gets to go and say, you matter, and we see you, and we care about you, and we want to serve you and let you know God sees you. And so this is an incredible uh, opportunity, and I just want to say thank you guys for, for, for uh, supporting us. So let's get into our class today. I'm excited about Hope, but I'm also excited about God's Word. I thank Steve uh, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me as your guest speaker today. And I love the fact that you've been studying the Gospel of John. Because we need to spend more time in the Gospels. Why? Because who we follow at Hope Worldwide and who we follow as followers of Jesus, we follow, we follow Jesus. And, and really, there's so many distractions right now. And it's really good to come back and say, who am I really about? Uh, who am I following? And so we're going to be looking at John chapter 20, verse 19 through 31. I love this passage. I've, I've taught on it a couple of times, but today's a little different. I've been uh, following Jesus for 39 years. And I, I can tell you, I can tell you, and it started when I was a college student, I can tell you that every time when I read the Bible, something new comes out. And so today is one of those one of those times where it came out in the passages we're going to look at. Uh, so I want, to, I want to share them with you. So let's start in John chapter 20. And before we read, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to just say thank you today. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. Father, I want to pray right now for the needs of many in this room. God, there's so many different needs. And I want to pray for your Holy Spirit to speak to the need. And so that, Father, we can leave here inspired. We can leave here 
uh, challenged to, to, to focus more on you, but also, God, encouraged that you love us so much that you're willing to go through everything for us. Please use me as an instrument and fill me with your spirit. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. John chapter 20, verse 19 and 20, it says here, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So this is Easter Sunday, so we know what day it is. These guys had not seen Jesus yet. This is their very first time. Who had seen Jesus was, was Mary Magdalene and a couple of other women. They were the first ones to witness the resurrected Jesus. And then after that, there was these two guys that were traveling to Emmaus. Interestingly enough, they were discouraged, and Jesus walked with them for seven miles. And it's a very interesting story. I love that story. He walked with them, and he revealed himself to them. And so they came back, and they're in this meeting. And so when you see this, you see what is the state of the disciples right here? Where are they at emotionally? I mean, they're trembling with fear. They killed our leader, and they're probably going to come after us as well to wipe us out. And, and it says here they're, they're locked in a room. And it's interesting that you can't lock Jesus out of any meeting. He's going to show up at any meeting. And it's really cool because some of us like, uh, you know, the... the, the you know, all the, the, the different uh, science fiction movies where there's teleport, teleportation of, of body material. That's so cool, but nobody's ever done it except Jesus. And Jesus' physical body defied the laws of physics. So he could literally show up anywhere in his physical body. The cool thing is, is that those of us who follow Jesus and are going to cross over to the other side and be with him, we're going to get that same body. Can you imagine the kind of stuff we'll be able to do on the other side? That's pretty cool. Just show up and, and, and move around. I mean, that, that's, that's pretty exciting to think about. I can't wait for that to happen. But Jesus shows up in the center of the meeting. And what does he say to them in the midst of their fear? Peace be with you. Jesus didn't come and say, you know what, before we get started, I just want to say that you guys, you need to hear, you need to own the fact that not one of you stood by me when I was being crucified. You guys, all, every single one of you ran away. Did Jesus do that? Jesus did not do that. And it's really important because, you know, they probably were already feeling some shame that they didn't stand by Jesus when he was crucified. And, you know, for, for all of us, I don't know how you came to church today, but it's not unusual for me to come to church and feel a little shame. Things that happened this week, things that have gone on in my life. And I want you to hear today what Jesus is saying to you. Peace be with you. In fact, I'd like you to go ahead and say it, turn to your neighbor and say, Peace be with you. I feel bad for the brother right here because he's got nobody next to him. He's all by himself in the whole aisle. Peace be with you from here to me to you. Peace be with you. But you know, I love that about Jesus because sometimes we think that Jesus is very corrective. And you know, if you're a guest here today, I want to welcome you, but I also, want to, I also want to encourage you to get to know who Jesus really is. And not use your religious background or maybe how you were raised, because it might not be correct. In fact, you may have a false view of Jesus. And it's so important that we get into the scriptures to see, because Jesus would have had every reason to lay them out and tell them, you guys failed miserably, but
but I'm going to give you a second chance. He didn't even go there. He said, peace be with you. And, and, he, and he goes on and he, and he, he gives them assurance, okay, because this is really important. I don't know if you struggle with faith, and we're going to get into that in a little bit, but he shows them his hands and he shows them his side. And the wound in his side was the size of my hand because that's the size of a Roman spear right below his rib cage. And he shows him that. And he tells him, in no, no other terms, guys, I died for you, but I'm back. And I'm back, and I'm back to do what we talked about for the last three years. We're going to finish this work, and we're going to help the world have peace. We're going to help the world find a relationship with God. You know, when I first started coming to church, that was one of the things that I really appreciated because, you know, when you think about attending church, you go... You know, it's just another meeting, maybe. But the emphasis when I was studying the Bible was a relationship. A relationship with God. That I could talk to him. I could walk with him. He was going to interact with me. He was going to be with me in my everyday life. And I needed it. And that's what I want to remind you of, is that, that Jesus is there. And then he goes on and continues in verse 21. Again, Jesus said, he says it twice, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And you, and if you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven. These are powerful words right here. Anybody struggling with forgiving somebody here in the room? Don't raise your hand. Please don't raise your hand. I mean, that's powerful. He's given them power. And I believe that when Jesus breathed on them and gave them the Holy Spirit, he gave them the power to be courageous men. Because the truth of the matter is, before this, they were afraid. And they received a a, a gift. And and when I was a young man, I received the Holy Spirit when I was baptized. And that that power gave me the ability to treat women differently. Because I would objectify them. I was a lustful man. And I didn't want to be the person that I was. But I felt like I didn't have the power to make that change. And then here comes the Holy Spirit to give me that power to make changes. I don't know if there's anything in your life right now that you're struggling with, but I want to give you assurance that the Holy Spirit can give you the power to make that change. But he gave it, but it's really important that we receive it. He gave them peace. He said, peace be with you, but it's your responsibility to receive it. And I want us to look at the word that is peace be with you. Peace, the word that he uses here is shalom. It's a Middle Eastern uh, term. It's a word that the Jewish people use and also the Arabic people use. Pronounced a little differently, but it essentially means peace be with you. But in the New Testament, and what Jesus said in the context of where he was it meant so much more for the very first time. It meant that they could be reconciled to God, that they could have peace with God. Have you ever had a time in your life where you didn't feel peace? And especially with God? You're, you're overcome with guilt, shame. Maybe, maybe you've gone through a, a breakup, maybe a divorce, maybe, maybe you know, your friend... You know, maybe you got fired and maybe, maybe something that just brought tremendous shame on you. And Jesus is saying, listen, I came to bring you peace. And when we were in the class earlier this morning for the, the teachers, I talked about it's so important that you identify right now what's keeping peace out of your life. What's keeping peace out of your life? We live, in a, we live in a society right now where there's not a lot of peace. There's wars. There's division. There's people berating each other. And if you're not careful, that can, that can affect you. 
if you're watching the news too much, definitely can affect you. But you got to understand where a lot of that talk is coming from. Is it coming from Jesus? Is it coming from the enemy? The devil himself. And if, if you don't believe in the devil, take a look at our society. I mean, it's evidence how he wants to bring turmoil, not peace. He wants to bring division. And again, it's our choice if we're going to receive the peace that Jesus gives us or are we going to say, no, no, I'm going to be influenced by other things when we desperately want it so badly, right? And the definition in the New Testament is, it says here, shalom is revealed as a reconciliation of all things to God through the work of Christ. God was pleased through Christ to reconcile himself to all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through Christ's blood shed on the cross. On Colossians 1, verse 19 and 20. Shalom experienced is multidimensional, complete well-being. Think about that for a minute. Complete well-being. Uh, just full disclosure, I, I worked as a therapist for three years. And the people that I worked with as a therapist were people who were struggling with, with depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts. And the vast majority of them were children. And it, it just used to really wreck my heart that here is a child that should be experiencing joy, peace, fun, love. And yet they don't have it because the enemy has done an incredible work, an, an awful work in their family. So it's not just spiritual, but it's also physical, psychological, social, and spiritual. It flows from all of one's relationships being put right with God. Everything that I have today that is good is a result of what God has done in my life. And if you want more good in your life, I want to encourage you to lean into God so that he can do this good work, so that he can give you shalom. Look at the, and this is why it was so, it didn't come, it didn't come cheap. In, in Isaiah 53, this shalom, it says in Isaiah 53 verse 5, it says, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us shalom, or peace as it's written, was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Stop and think about that. The price that God, that Jesus paid, so you, can, I, you and I can have peace. Why on earth would we allow our society to over-influence us to lose peace? When God is is is, is trying desperately to say, you need to focus on me and what I've given you and not on this troubled world. We read on in verse 24, it says, now Thomas, known as Didymus, one of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see the nail marks on his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. That's pretty defiant. I mean, Thomas has a bad rap in the scriptures, but what I respect and appreciate about Thomas, he's honest. And as we're in this meeting together, I am absolutely sure there are a few of you in this room today who you are struggling with your faith. You're not sure. It's really important to be honest. Don't play the game. Be honest. What are you struggling with? What's, what's creating doubts? And, you know, when you read Thomas's words, there's probably some stuff behind it. It's not just this. There's probably some stuff behind it. That's another thing that I learned in the world of therapy. When you see people act out and they're, they're going through, there's probably something going on inside. 
fact, the training that I received, they said, don't look at what they do. Think about what happened to them to get them in the state that they're in. I mean, and that really helped me to do the work is, is to try to help them share what, what's been your experience. What's caused all this anxiety and depression and anger and frustration? What's created it? And for sure, Thomas, he probably had some stuff behind this. He's frustrated. And he's very defiant. Cool thing is, do you think Jesus heard him say this even though he wasn't in the meeting afterwards? Well, let's find out. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. The door was locked, but you can't keep Jesus out. Jesus came and stood among them, and he said it again, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Thomas, put your finger right here in my hand, right here in the hole in my hand. And put your, and, and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And, you know, I, I love this passage because Jesus meets, Thomas meets us where we are. And it's so important that you don't romanticize doubt. There's a lot of people today that this, this deconstruction of faith and, and different things, people are romanticizing doubt. Questioning faith and thinking that it's, you know, it's, it's cool or it's, it's normal. I understand it. I get it. We all have doubts. And that's the incredible thing about the scriptures is the Bible's very open about the disciples that didn't have faith. It says some didn't believe right there at the, in the scriptures. And this was after the resurrection. And so it's so important that you and I are honest. What? What is it that is creating doubts for you? And just like Thomas probably has something to do with your experience. And this is where it happens in churches, okay? In my job, I get to travel around the country. I get to visit different churches in our fellowship of churches. And there's some stuff happening. But is it necessary? And one of the things that I think we didn't do a great job of as leaders is to, to have, you know, how they have the fine print and maybe not be fine print, but just have it in the print. You're going to be a part of a church, but the people in the church are not 100 percent all put together. In fact, some of them can hurt you. They can let you down. Even leaders. I love Steve and Carrie. They're incredible, but they're not perfect. And if we put people on a pedestal, they're going to let us down. And so that's why it's so important that our faith is not in, in people and in leaders, but our faith is in God. And that, that, that we can get through those things because of our faith in God. And I'm sure that it was a time of reflection, but I want to share this story with you of Carolina. We met her earlier this year when we traveled down to Brazil for a trip. They celebrated their 33rd year anniversary, and my wife and I had the privilege to plant that church, to start it as missionaries. So they invited us to go back. And we met this woman, Carolina, and she told us her story. And she lives in the remote part of Rio de Janeiro called Paracambi. And she was a single mom, had two kids, divorced, and was struggling with severe depression to the point she didn't want to live anymore. And in the world of therapy, when somebody has a plan for suicide, it's serious. And her plan was she was going to walk out into one of the busiest highways and take her life. And so she's, she's walking towards the highway, and this young man passes right in front of her, right in front of her, and says, hi, I wanted to invite you to come to church. 
And she's shocked. I mean, she's, she's in, a, in a world of hurt. And then for someone to come and just at that, that moment to invite her to church. And, and she said, okay, I, I'll, I'll consider it. Let's go. How do I get in contact? She said, why don't you come with me? And, and there's a group of us that are out here sharing. And the guy said, I am not yet a member of the church, but I'm learning how to share, share my faith. And so I saw you and wanted to invite you to come. And so she goes over and meets the group. She decides to start studying the Bible. She gets baptized. She basically no longer struggles with depression because she knows that now God loves her. She invited her sons to come to church. She invited her ex-husband to come to church and his wife to come to church. And they all got baptized. And you just go, now here's the scary part. She goes, what happened to that young man? That, who is he? Where, where is he? The young man that came and stopped me from killing myself. And they said, what young man? What's he look like? She described him. And they said, we don't know anybody like that. So you draw your own conclusion, but she believes, and I accept her testimony, that it was an angel of God that wanted to save her life. This woman in her, in her village of Paracambi, they had a flood, in their, in their, and Hope Worldwide was able to send some, some, some water filters, and they decide to throw a church service in her village, and it's a one-street village, and they have this church service there, and they put up tents and everything, and there's a hundred people that showed up to this service, and they all brought, all brought, the people from the village brought their food, and it was just like, and guess who preached the message that morning? Carolina did. She shared her testimony. And it's so important for you and I to see God is working to save people. But we've got to believe. We've got to wrestle our doubt to the ground. And, and we've got to, and, and, you know, it really encouraged me that what we do as a church when we talk to people and share with people, it's life-giving work. Because we don't know what they're going through. We don't know what's happening in their lives. But it could be at the, just the right moment to save them from something really awful. So let's wrap up the story. Thomas, he said to him, and it doesn't say whether he did it or not, but he said to them, he said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. What happened to his faith? In an instant. In an instant. Because Jesus faced his doubts and helped him. And he also faced his doubts and in an instant, my Lord and my God, then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you believe, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That means us. That means us. An extra blessing. Because we study the scriptures out. And you know, the resurrection is probably one of the, if you look at law, legal evidence, the resurrection is, if you do the research, it's, it's one of the most striking proofs of you've got witnesses, eyewitnesses, different people, different times who witnesses Jesus' res resurrection. But you've got to lean into it. And I love this about Jesus because he brought Thomas back from doubt. If you're struggling with doubt today, I want to encourage you. You can be brought back from your doubt. But you've got to be responsible for your doubts. And, and I, I just want to encourage you. Don't allow anyone or anything to come between you and God. And that's hard. 
Because we want to blame other people for our sour attitude with God. God had nothing to do with it. It's a, it's a person, a flawed person. And that was one of the things that I had to do as a therapist with children is help them recover and trust again. When their trust was devastated by the people that care for them the most or should care for them the most, their parents. So let's wrap it up. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. There's more? Oh, yeah. I can't wait to get to heaven and, 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 and to be able to see the videos. And yes, there will be videos. There's gonna, I, I can't wait to see the video of Thomas's face when Jesus showed up and said, put your hand right here. I want to see that video. I have so many other videos that I want to watch. But they're not written in this book, but they're written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So can I ask you a very honest question? Are you experiencing that life? In your marriage, in your family? And if you're not, I want to encourage you today to lean into God. You know, I've been doing this a long time. What, what I love about this is there's no ceiling for your growth. I'm still learning things about myself and about God that I've never understood. And I've read the Bible through cover to cover many times. And I'm still learning. And I'm still learning about me. I'm still learning about people. And what Jesus wants to do, but you, you've got to do the diligence and lean into getting to know Jesus for yourself and getting to know God yourself. I'm going to leave you with some, some, some challenges, okay? Some encouragement, okay? Number one, I want to encourage you to live in the assurance of the resurrection. In fact, as we said, I think it's so important that you and I realize that we have the power to bestow peace on people. And when people come to church, people like even tomorrow at school or at work, I want to encourage you to be a, a giver of peace and to tell somebody at work, hey, peace be with you. Because if there's one thing that's needed in our world today, right now, in our, in our jobs and wherever we are, it's peace. And then identify the people and the things that are robbing your peace. Write them down. Share about them with somebody you trust, somebody who's close, somebody who you could, you could be honest with. See, because when you get it out, you can manage it. But if you hold it in, it just sits there and stirs up trouble. And then the third thing is deal with doubt. Jesus didn't tell Thomas, hey, Thomas, I want to encourage you to stop doubting. He said, don't doubt. Stop doubting. God doesn't want us to romanticize doubt, no matter what our society is doing. We need to be in hot pursuit of strong faith, strong assurance of who God is and what his word says about how to live a full life. And then the last thing is, is live in faith and assurance. If you ever need some assurance, it's important to go back and watch what Jesus went through on the cross. Whenever I'm going through a hard time, when I read about what Jesus went through for me to get me through this time, it gives me great assurance. I can make it. We can make it. And so I'll leave you with that. I'm going to pray for the communion right now as we remember what Jesus went through for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you this morning. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he did everything that he did for us. He saved us from our sins. And he suffered on the cross. And I pray that we can visualize him on the cross. And recognize, God, that there are things in our lives that we need to let go of. And there are things in our lives that we need forgiveness from you. Whether it's doubt. Whether it's sin. 
I pray, God, that we can bring it before you and receive full forgiveness. God, we pray for your spirit to come over us and help us to change. We pray for shalom in our hearts and our minds so we can live the life, the full life that Jesus had in store for us. Bless this communion, God. Thank you that we can take it and remember Jesus and all that he did for us. Forgive us and help us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.